from Boston, Massachusetts, it's theCUBE. Covering Activio 2019 Data Driven. Brought to you by Activio. Welcome back to Boston, everybody. My name is Dave Vellante. I'm here with my co-host, Stu Miniman. John Furrier is also here today. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in on-the-ground tech coverage. This is day one of Actifio 19 Data Driven con uh, uh, Conference. Hashtag Data Driven 19. Greg Karamitis is here. He's the Senior Vice President of Fantasy Sports at DraftKings. Greg, thanks for coming on. What a, what a cool title. Oh uh, yeah, it's, it's you know, I was joking with my wife. Anytime you can be working in fantasy sports, it's a great place to be. Everybody's a little bit jealous. So the formula's easy, right? Offer big, giant prizes, and everybody comes, and that's all there is to it, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. The Anybody can come in. I just have the dream job right now. So hugely competitive market. You guys have you know, become the leader. We hear you on the radio. We check out your websites. I mean, take us through sort of DraftKings and your ascendancy, how you got here. Gotcha. So, you know, company started in 2012, initially around sort of the, uh, you know, the major big American uh, sports. Um, and then really, um, as we started to scale out, we saw there was a huge consumer interest in the product. Um, players that would come on were very, very, very sticky. Um, and we've just been kind of, you know, pushing on, pushing on growing that user base. Um, so the initial founders are, uh, you know, three former analysts, uh, so they've come on. It's always been sort of a very analytically driven company. So they looked at what we were dealing with and it was, we had LTVs that were way higher than our CACs. So let's keep marketing and growing and growing and growing and finding out ways to offer a better product. So over 2015, we did a major marketing blitz, blew up the company absolutely huge. Um, and since then, we've been just constantly innovating, adding new sports, adding new features, um, and adding ways to add on the product. And then even more recently, um, just about a year ago, we expanded also into online sports betting um, over in New Jersey as uh, that's become a legal product across the US. So it's been a great time to be at the company, a lot of fun. What what was your first sport? Was it like Amazon started in books and then you know scaled out? What was your first sport? So it's actually the first sport was baseball because of the time that they actually launched. So it was the middle of April. Sporting calendar's a little bit thin right then. So it was base it was baseball to start, and then once football season started, that's really when things take off. And you said 2015 is when you started the marketing blitz, and I remember just hearing the ads, and it was just intense. I was like, wow, this company's go going for it. So you sort of took all the chips and went all in, yep. and it worked. Yeah, I mean, it's that's part of the uh, you know. The, the lifeblood of the company. It's, we're a company that ends up being taking risks, uh, but we take calculated risks. So at any given point, you sort of say like, hey, what is the, what is the range of outcomes over here? Um, we're not playing for second place. We want to be a market leader. So you have to take risks in order to be a market leader. So let's take calculated risks. Let's make not, sure we're not being insane. But you know, we did the math. We figured out we, this, is a, this is a worthwhile shot. We pushed in for it, um, and it really took off from there. Love to bet on short things. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> Greg, we, we know the people that play the fantasy sports feel that data is what differentiates whether they're going to live in, uh, you know, win or lose. Talk to us a little bit about the data journey inside your business and how that helps differentiate DraftKings in the market. Yeah, so we think DraftKings is one of the most analytically based companies in the uh, you know, definitely in the market, but also in sort of like of general companies right now. Um, we use uh, our analytics platform to inform pretty much everything we do. Um, and you know, to your point, you were joking, you know, it seems like fantasy sports is easy, throw out some giant prizes there and everything will take care of itself. You know, running a fantasy sports com uh, company, if you throw out a contest that's too big, you lose a ton of money. Um, there's a lot of asymmetric risk in the business where if we are right, we make a little bit more, but if we are wrong, we lose a ton very, very, very fast. So our ability to be very, very sound analytically is what allows us to sort of push the envelope and grow, 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 um, but not you know, lose our heads along the way. You know, some of the fun of that is really, you know, when we first ran, I think one of the most game-changing contests we ran was actually back in October of 2014. It was the very first Millionaire Maker contest. Um, I can still remember it was week five of the 20, 2014 NFL season where we said, hey, this is crazy. Um, we need crazy things to happen in order for it to work, but if we run a $20 contest to enter with a million dollar top prize and two million of total prizes, um, it could go viral, it could go absolutely crazy, and if it loses, here's how it'll lose and here's how much it'll hurt us it's a worthwhile risk, let's go for it. Um, so that sort of energy of you know, doing discipline analysis and constantly sort of then taking the risk on the back of it is what allowed us to grow and a lot. And the brand value that you would have got out of that was sort of worth that, that risk in part anyway, and you wouldn't have got too hurt presumably in terms of Exactly, we knew our downside, and as long as you know your downside, you're normally in a pretty good spot to take those risks. So, where do you see this all going? I mean, so the company has grown, you're at this kind of critical mass now. Yep. Like we said, highly competitive, you know, you knock down, you know, if you take your eye off the ball. So how do you guys keep this going? All right. So we have a huge challenge ahead of us over the next couple of years as sports betting becomes legal across the US, we need to make sure that we are one of the top competitors in that market. 
Sports betting uh, in the U.S. we expect to be an absolutely enormous market. Um, it will probably be significantly larger than the fantasy sports market in terms of absolute revenue, um, and even you know an order of magnitude more competitive. So we need to be executing at each step along the way. Um, as markets open up, we need to be able to get into the get into market very very fast, and that means our tech team needs to be working feverishly to make sure that we can hit the requirements that each legislator and each regulator puts on market entry in their state. We need to be making sure we're constantly figuring out what are the product elements that are absolutely critical for our, for our users. Um, is it more around the live betting experience? Is it around the different markets that you offer? Is it around pricing? And how do we find these, th these different levers and pull them to make sure that we're putting out a great product for users? And if we do that and throw a great product out for users, we're pretty sure we can maintain and that market. you want to be one-stop shopping, presumably, right? I mean, all sports, right? But, but then you've got these niche sports betting. I mean, the best example I could think of is horse racing. Yep. You know, where it's, it's alive, it's got a video, it's got you know commentators you know on the ground that you know know the business really well. Is that is it the strategy to go sort of horizontal and sort of be a one-stop shop, or are you going to sort of pick your spots? What does the data tell you? You know, I think we're constantly talking about it. One of the things that allowed our fantasy sports business to grow so fast was going a little bit more horizontal. Mm -hmm. um, so we offered golf in mass at a time period when the primary competitor in the space, FanDuel, did not. Um, and we built that product into one of our largest sports. It's you know right up there with MLB in terms of the actual size that, that comes in. Um, as we've gone also horizontal, we pulled in other places like NASCAR, MMA, great sports that people are interested in. It gets more users into our platform. And honestly, if users are interested in a product, we don't want them to have to go elsewhere. Um, we want to be able to have the offerings that any sort of you know, critical mass type environment is going gonna, is gonna to have. Well, it's that experience, right? We, I like to shop at Amazon, you do too, because I trust it and it's the same user experience, right? So, Greg, one of the things I'm hearing from you is something that everybody tries for, but it's really challenging. That's speed. How do you react that fast and move the company into new markets and new offerings and, and keep innovating? You know, how, how, culturally, you know, technology-wise, you know, yeah. how, how does DraftKings do that? You know, I think as a, as a company, you know, from really every single person that we recruit and hire, we've been actually executionally disciplined um, throughout the company's history. It's, it's something that our founders did a great job of instilling in the culture right out the gates, um, and we've tried to foster all the way uh, along the way, which is all the best strategies of the world, they're going to fail if you can't execute well. And every single person down the company knows that. And we try to you know, enable each person to be as autonomous as possible in their ability to execute their, their portion of the business. That allows us to move really, really, really fast. Um, you know, we disseminate that responsibility quickly and each leader and sort of each person knows what they have to do to execute. There's a high degree of accountability behind that. Um, you know, I'd like to say there's some, there's some magic recipe, there's some secret sauce, but it's a lot of just great people doing great work every day. Well, well Greg, uh, you know, is there any of your competitors that they, they look at? You know, Boston's been, been doing pretty well in DraftKings era, uh, you know, for the last few years. Yep. <laughs> uh, so Boston's been a great market for us. We've expanded a ton over here. Um, and uh, the sports teams have been fantastic. Uh, although the Bruins, it was a little bit sad about game seven over there, but you know, it happens. So is MLB the flagship? I mean, is that? Uh, no, I wouldn't say that. MLB was first primarily just of the, the time of the year when we launched. NFL is always going to be, right, okay. or not always going to be, but for the, you know, for the foreseeable future is the dominant U.S. sport um, and will remain the dominant U.S. sport. Yeah, the reason I ask is like, I mean, kids don't watch MLB anymore. Maybe the, maybe the playoffs. I mean, the games, there was a game, I think on some Father's Day, it was like almost five hours long, yep. you know? Yeah, up against golf, right? <laughs> you can come in and out, but um, you know, what are some of the trends you're seeing? You know, soccer, is that growing? Uh, NFL obviously is huge. Do you see sort of niche sports like lax coming on? So, uh, you know, starting point, NFL has been huge. We actually launched a new product uh, a little over a year ago called Showdown, which allowed you to start to do fantasy for a single game as opposed to yes. the combination of games. Love it. That's taken off fantastically because that's tapping into more of the, I'm going to sit down and watch this game and I would love to have a fantasy team on, that, on, on this game. Um, that's really um, like expanded the audience I thought that was genius because look, if you're out of the, the running, yeah. it doesn't matter. Week exactly. to week. <laughs> yeah. Um, on top of that, NBA and NHL are on fire. The NBA's put out a great product as an actual sport league. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the finals were great. You hate to see the injuries, but it was a great final series, very competitive. The NHL finals has been very, very competitive. Golf is growing phenomenally as a sport. Um, we saw far more interesting golf than I ever anticipated when I had first started with the company, and it's one of the most exciting things. When the Masters comes each year, every screen is turned to it, and we see huge player, uh, player numbers kind of coming into that one. 
beyond that, you know, NASCAR, what's been interesting, NASCAR's been having a tough couple years, but the truck series for us, we launched it this year, and the trucks have been great. I don't know if you've watched NASCAR trucks, they're wildly entertaining. Um, you know, MMA, you got the big fighters, so every sport sort of has its moments. It's a matter of like picking those moments and figuring out how to make the most of them. Do you see boxing at all making a comeback? Or? So we have thought about how to get boxing into a, uh, into a fantasy contest. We don't have it at the moment. Um, we're putting a lot of thought into it. So we are actually seeing through, um, we've seen, you know, we've been in the MMA space and we've seen the growth out from there where that sport's doing great and you look at places like Bellator, or the Professional Fighters League as other leagues, and then boxing is the next step. There's a lot of interest there. I don't think they have the right products yet to be able to kind of engage with it that extra way. So that's one of the things we're working on. Also, you need a marquee fighter. You always need a marquee fighter to kind of help bring in the interest over on that side. So. Um, you know, it'll be interesting to see with Pacquiao on sort of the downside of his career at this right. point. Um, and Mayweather I, I, hasn't been fighting much. It'll be interesting to see who's that next main fighter that emerges. Well, I grew up in an era of marquee fighters where they would fight, you know, they literally fight six, seven, eight times a year, you know, and you had huge, huge names. And, and, and so, and then MMA comes along and it's really hurt the sport. But it feels like it's trying to sort of resuscitate. Yeah, I mean, I think these things can be a little bit cyclical. Like, you get one marquee fighter out there. Like, so uh, my wife is Filipino, so I'm a huge Pacquiao fan now. Um, we, you know, we watch every fight even when we were living in remote locations that forced us to watch it at weird hours. He's a type of athlete that could bring popularity to the sport. So if there was a major U.S. fighter that gains that degree of sort of, uh, you know, that, that degree of fame, um, people will be into it, I think. Do, you, do, you, do your analytics sort of have a probe into the activity at the, at the fan level, at the sports level, not just the, the fantasy level or the, or the betting level? Is that a sort of a... Uh, a, a predictor for you. Yeah, we see a lot of correlations between how many people play our sport, uh, our fantasy game, and how many people actually follow the underlying sport. We can also see trends in terms of, if I'm from Boston, um, I probably pick more Patriots in my fantasy lineups than, uh, than normal. Um, and you can actually see that as people play different sports, that you know the number one QB drafted in, in Boston is almost always going to be Tom Brady. And once you leave there, you start seeing Aaron Rodgers pop up the list really, really, really fast. So you see these little micro trends where it's like you are still a sports fan of your local team and your local environment, um, but, and it manifests itself in the fantasy play. So what do you think that is? Do you think it's uh, fan affinity, or do you think it's just a sort of lack of knowledge outside your sort of circle of trust? I think it's probably a combination. I mean, I can say as, you know, following the Celtics in the, uh, the mid-2000s, I knew the depth of the Celtics bench and how they would use their rotation better than anybody else, or, you know, probably better than anybody else. The coaches would probably disagree. But it's like, I knew that James Posey was a huge value play on oh, certain nights. Awesome. I knew I kind of would, like, feel the Eddie House nights. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, on your local team, you probably know those players that are the, the, not the top, top echelon all-stars, but the guys right beneath, you know them a little bit better and probably more comfortable using them. What's your favorite sport to participate in? So my favorite sport from a fantasy perspective is I play all the basket, I play all the football. Uh -huh. I play basketball just during playoffs. And I play baseball, but baseball, I'm strictly a fantasy player. I don't really follow the sport too carefully. I'm just playing fantasy. Okay. So, oh. <laughs> That's great. So what do you think of the conference here? You, have, you, have you had any time to interact? I know you were swamped after coming off the stage. Yeah, you know, it, it looks like a great turnout over here. There's a lot of enthusiasm amongst the different people. Um, I was a little bit late to the late to show up this morning, so and I got a bit swamped, so I'm eager to go and uh, be able to, to catch up a bit more. Great. Well, Greg, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. It was great to have you. Really Perfect. a pleasure meeting you. Great chat with you, sir. Great chat with you. All right, keep it right there. Stu and I will be back with our next guest. John Furrier is also in the house. You're watching theCUBE from Actifio, Data Driven 19. We'll be right back.